Well, Cinderella as a story is very universal, isn't it? Every culture has their, um, their version of it. There are many, many versions of it. Um, but it was very specifically the music that drew me to it uh, as a piece of dance, as a piece of dance theatre. Uh, the music of Prokofiev. I'd sort of fallen in love with it watching Frederick Ashton's ballet in my sort of early 20s, I guess, and seen it quite a lot. And the score is one that kind of grows on you. It sort of insinuates itself upon you. And it, it's, you need to hear it more than once in a way. And I did see it lots of times and I thought, this is wonderful. Um, so when I did get the opportunity to be able to create a piece of my own based on that music, um, having just done Swan Lake, actually, in the history of my company, it comes just after Swan Lake, two years later, um, I knew I had to do something different. Uh, people were sort of expecting it. They would have been surprised if it had been <laughs> a straightforward version. Um, so I did a little bit of research and started reading around uh, its creation and uh, read that it was written during the Second World War um, and premiered just after at the Bolshoi and then a couple of years later in London with Ashton's version. Um, and that really set me off on a path that uh, made me want to listen to the music in a different way. I, I listened to it with different ears with that era in mind, because there is a, a sense of darkness in it and a, a sense of doom, as well as all the magic and all the, uh, the fairy tale uh, magic that you expect from it. It's definitely a piece that allows uh, an audience to feel for the characters, understand their journey. The other thing that I think Matthew's version does very well is allow you to listen to the music um, and hear the darker shades of it. There were tones of um, darkness that often are not shown in the traditional ballet. I think the, the period is very much reflected in the music uh, to the point where it just was like a, a revelation listening to it again where it all sort of fell into place, the, the idea of Cinderella uh, as this sort of movie fan young girl who dreams of uh, escape from her horrible family, as is in all versions of Cinderella. A sense of escapism, which was a very important thing at that time. The sense of the idea of somebody going missing. Um, the, the image of a, a, sh a, a beautiful sort of 40s shoe in the rubble of the Blitz, the, the, the uh, a blitz bombing was a very strong image for me. It was, in fact, our original poster. And people falling in love very quickly, people not knowing whether they were going to live for a, another day, a week, a month, a year, whatever it may be, was a great uh, part of this story that seemed to make a lot of sense and, and people getting lost and finding each other. I chose to work with Les Brotherston again, who's been my regular designer for the last nearly 30 years now. And we just had this great success with Swan Lake, so it was a natural to work with Les again. And of course, uh, all our film, uh, we're both great film fans, so it was a perfect subject for us. And we hit on a, a few things which really were significant. One of them was the film A Matter of Life and Death, another uh, Powell and Pressburger film. Um, uh, where David Niven is the pilot who's sort of uh, in a burning plane, obviously uh, about to crash to his death and, and is on the radio to a, a young woman uh, and they sort of fall in love in this conversation and then he doesn't actually die. It's a wonderful, kind of whimsical, uh, bizarre story but really beautiful. And I thought there was something in that, the idea of Cinderella hovering between life and death. And of course, Les went with that idea of uh, uh, using that period very strongly in the in the uh, in, a, in a very literal and, and authentic way in the designs. Before we even begin rehearsals for Cinderella, um, when you know you're doing the show, Matt will send through lots of research material, um, films we need to watch, books we need to read, YouTube links, websites, and that's kind of our beginning point. So we come into the room very prepared already. Um, and then you start interacting with the other characters who have done the same thing. And then it becomes easier to know what would my character do here? What, what step would she do here? Why would she dance like this? Um, and that's kind of, yeah, the beginning step. And then obviously Matt and the team teach us the choreography. And it's a very collaborative experience, which is super rewarding for us. 
But actually looking into real situations and real incidents and real people's stories. And the story that really affected us a lot was the uh, bombing of the Café de Paris, which was uh, an actual uh, incident that happened that we based our ballroom scene on. So Leslie's set sort of looks like a, like a, um, a bombed out building, most of it. Uh, or, some, or people sort of still trying to live in a bombed out building, at least initially. Um, but the idea of a, ball, a ballroom, which is essential to the story of Cinderella, going to the ball, um, was so uh, powerful uh, that we had this idea that the, the, the bombed ballroom would be brought back to life. And we had this sense of rewinding time, playing with time and bringing, the, bringing all these, unfortunately, uh, dead dancing couples back to life. Um, and that gave it a sort of uh, real period uh, sense of what, what life was like then, actually. But also it, it, it has its own sense of magic and um, uh, obviously a very uh, moving aspect to it as well, which was really lovely for, this, for the music and for this story. You have to go with the, the flow of the time differences and the, um, the, the, the playing with reality and um, dreams is very significant in the piece, more so than in the usual story of Cinderella. Um, act one is, is very straightforward in many ways, apart from the appearance of an angel, who's obviously looking out for Cinderella. But um, it, what happens at the end of act one is Cinderella, having met this pilot uh, that she's kind of become very uh, enamored with, I um, wouldn't say she necessarily fallen in love with him yet, but it's, it's very, they've only just met, but she obviously sees him as a heroic figure. And she's she's uh, found this uh, person she can identify with in some ways. Um, they get caught up in a, a, a scene we call the blackout, eventually ending up in a, in a bombing raid, and uh, she gets injured. Uh, they lose each other. She gets hurt, injured at the end of it. And in a sense, then we go into a sort of, uh, from that point onwards, through to the, near the end of Act Two, we're really going into her head, where the angel sort of captures her, uh, catches her almost, and stops her from dying, and takes her into this, in, as she sees it, into this fantasy world, takes her off to the ball. And um, I guess not everyone gets that because there's a sense in a way that people want the, rea the reality of the meeting at the ball and all those, the, the bits of the story that people love. Um, but really it's all in her head and they don't actually meet again in my version till act three. And one of the lovely things about the story is when they do meet, he isn't really this great hero heroic figure. He's an ordinary guy. She's an ordinary girl. They just happen to click and they, they are one of many stories uh, wartime stories and that that happens in the railway scene at the end where they sort of almost disappear into the crowd and I love that I love the fact that they're just two ordinary people who fall in love What I wanted to do with the character of Cinderella is not make her too downtrodden, too much of a victim. It's quite boring these days to have those sort of characters. You know, this is so often portrayed in that way as meek and mild and done to. She's a dreamer, she's sort of, a, she's a movie fan. When we first see Cinderella, she's kind of in the typical position that you'd see her in. She's sweeping, she's cleaning while the uh, stepsisters are being horrible to her. So she's a very downtrodden, mistreated character, but she's very kind, she's optimistic and hopeful, and she's a dreamer. At any opportunity, she goes to the cinema. She loves old Hollywood glamour and actresses and really dreams of that life. Um, so she's a very positive, optimistic person, determined and, you know, believes that her situation will change. So she, and she's quite feisty, she's quite, she sort of fights her situation. She decides to leave. Uh, rather than being swept away in, a, in a, a pumpkin that's turned into a coat, she actually packs her bags and goes. A duet that everyone loves in this piece is the dummy duet, as we call it. Um, and it was very much 
designed to um, create more for the, the dancer playing the character of the pilot, Harry. So he makes this early appearance. She meets him before the ball and then she imagines her brother Malcolm's tailor, he's a gentleman's tailor, I think, and uh, she imagines this uh, dummy as uh, the pilot, Harry, who she's just met. And we do a little nifty switch and it becomes uh, the, the dancer playing that role. And they do this duet where they're sort of dummy-like and um, it's fun, and it's, um, but also gives him a lot to do in, in Act One as well. Um, but that's quite nice because it shows her sense of fantasy and her sense of, of playfulness and the fact that she can rise above things in her, in her situation and she has these sort of little whims of fantasy and it does sort of lead you into other, other fantasies that she has later on. Harry, the pilot, uh, is quite an interesting character because he has two sides of him that you see. Um, so there's the reality side uh, and then there's the fantasy side. So the reality side, you see this uh, RAF pilot who's wounded, going through uh, PTSD, um, very lonely, very damaged. And then you have this fantasy side of him that Cinderella conjures up, uh, which is this Hollywood style leading man, everything that she thinks a man should be. So it's really nice to get to play with those two uh, different sides of him, really. Dancing with Ash is fantastic. Uh, she's one of those artists that's so present, um, but then also has this consistency that I've, I've never known before. And so you kind of, you always know what you're gonna get physically, but you get this uh, real emotional connection every time you do it, which makes it different and keeps it fresh when we do a long tour, or you get this kind of relationship that you build up uh, over the shows, which is really wonderful. We sat down a lot during rehearsals to discuss our characters and which way we wanted it to go. And you really bond and develop a friendship as well as a partnership for on stage. Um, but he's such a brilliant person to work with and he's so special and I think that hopefully really comes across. I decided to go for a much larger step family and it, it was... I've thought about this in work. People say, why are there so many characters, you know? And when we first did the piece, we didn't begin the way we do now. We began with a lot of characters all there at once and everyone was very confused. When I came to revive the piece, I realised that people wanted, at the beginning of the piece, they want to see the two sisters and Cinderella with a broom. That's what they wanted to see. And that's what we give people now at the beginning of the piece, briefly. And then we start to introduce these other characters, and I think it makes for a richer piece. Sybil is uh, Cinderella's stepmother. Um, we made some decisions about her background and decided that she was maybe a dancer to start with, moved into acting, um, probably had quite a successful career. But when we meet her in the show, she's at a quite low point. Um, probably her career has um, slow down and she's had lots of husband um, and lots of uh, children. Um, as a result she's very resentful, um, resentful towards her latest husband Robert. Um, she's very jealous of his relationship with Cinderella. Um, she finds her kids rather annoying and <laughs> loud um, and she's um, finding comfort in drinking. Um, she's quite evil, but I think is also the fact that she's very vulnerable inside. So I would say resentful, jealous, um, cunning, um, plotting, um, and um, also very glamorous. And she can appear calm, elegant, uh, but underneath there's a lot of um, anger. Some people still find it's a, a, a too many characters, but um, I think they're fun and I think they, they add something different. You get Malcolm, who's the sort of camp brother, who has this nice little story that runs through the piece where he meets uh, so his sister's boyfriend, who's an American GI. Out of time, we know, viewers. <laughs> we know we're a year too early, at least. Um, but... Um, 
that little story is very ni- it's a very nice story of, of them getting together through the piece and it's very touching actually by the end and I, I actually like the idea of a family that um, apart from stepmother who sort of remains a, a lost cause is that they all change during the piece when you meet them again at the, at, at the last scene in the railway station they've changed they've become more through her and through the story and through the war time experience uh, they've all become more nicer people, more caring people, and they, they end up as a family. The role I play is the angel. It's great because as opposed to the character being like a fairy godmother kind of role in the classical version, it's, um, he's obviously played by a male, and he, he's more of a guardian angel in, um, in Matthew's version. And um, he's, he's a very strong character, and... Um, almost as um, acts as a father figure to Cinderella. Um, obviously, you'll see through her journey, and he kind of makes sure she gets to the right kind of um, goes through the right path, basically. And he's just basically there to look after her and is in charge of her fate, basically. I wanted him to almost feel like he was um, hovering. Uh, just above stage level the whole time, <laughs> so that his movement is is very light and and, and floats almost. Um, he's also, interestingly, and this came about through uh, making the piece. He's not always an angel of for good. He is a, f- a fate figure. So although he he's looking after her and he's he, and she has to be deserving of that in a way as well. Uh, there also, there's a point in the end of Act Two where he appears to be signalling the destruction of, of London during a bombing raid, and that's part of him as well. That's the fate uh, situation, and, and, and that he is in control of life and death. One of the elements is often forgotten by people coming to the theatre or, or even seeing a film of, of a theatrical production is the lighting, which uh, Neil Austin did for us with this particular show. Uh, he's done an amazing job in, in capturing uh, not only the, the period feel, but also the, the sense of fantasy and the sense of um, uh, uh, within the reality of that, that uh, bombed out London setting. The hospital scene is, uh, I suppose, in a way, one of the more, more ingenious uh, uses of something very simple, which is just basically screens that move around and everyone's a doctor, you know, everyone's got a white coat and glasses on. And it's quite a strong uh, visual idea, and creating rooms, because I knew we had to travel between her room and his room and uh, uh, various other places that we go, the place where he has the electric shock treatment and stuff. And the way to do it, rather than lots of sets coming on and off, was through these, uh, rather ingeniously, through these hospital screens. And actually it's, uh, I've always found that audiences enjoy very much watching things come to life in front of their eyes in a, in a rather than a literal way, but in that sort of a more creative way. So that was, a, that was a nice sequence. My favourite sequence has to be the train station at the end. Um, not because it's the end of the show. Um, I just feel it's just so moving and so beautiful and it, and it really wraps the story up so well. Um, there's something so heartbreaking about it because everyone is saying goodbye to each other at the train station. And, but there's also something so uplifting about it because the journey of Cinderella, she's finally found the man she's always, you know, been looking for, you know, Um, and it's something she's always wanted. And so there's something so joyful about that, um, watching their journey as they they make their journey towards the train to kind of live happily ever after. Um, And my character in that, the angel, he dances around them and it's it's just so beautiful to dance and, the music's so amazing at the moment. It gives me bump, um, goosebumps every time I every time I dance it, and whenever I watch the show, it always makes me cry.
It's interesting with this Cinderella because, because it's called Cinderella, everyone's expecting a fairy tale. Um, and I hope people do get, still have that magical sort of experience. And people bring young, uh, their families to it. And it still delivers that, I believe. But, but within the story, she does actually have a one night stand, I have to say. She does, uh, rather than uh, on the night she goes to the ball, she does end up with our pilot hero. This is in her imagination, remember. But she uh, does spend the night with him. And the reason that no one has a problem with it, with a family audience, you know, a young family audience, is something to do with the period, I think. It's to do with this thing of two young people clinging on to each other in difficult circumstances, and the sense of what's going on around them. Nobody questions it. They all think this is you know, absolutely a human need and a, a thing that, would, that could and would happen. And I think it, there, you have to bring, if you're, t if you're telling the story of people uh, at that time and you're using those stories, those first-hand accounts, you, you have to deal with real people, real situations. I said this to the dancers quite a lot. Read the stories, read the, read the accounts of, of life then. We're playing real people here, we're not fairy tale characters. And um, I wouldn't say it was a particularly sexy show, but it's a show where love is an important, uh, and love and sex are an important elements in, in life and uh, needed at that time. And I think that's um, why I love this piece so much. I think it's about, about the human condition, it's about people, real people.